knots, but it's fine. Hi, welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our special guest James, the science tool boy. Hello! So, we're wearing togas, our kylixes are full, we're eating olives and we're going to discuss Cleopatra's first meeting with Julius Caesar. So obviously the first thing we need to talk about is why on earth did Cleopatra go to such a crazy extent to meet Julius Caesar? Taylor. So one of the first things is that she needed support with Egypt and you can break this down into quite a few different reasons. So one of them is obviously power. She wanted to maintain her control on Egypt and keep, can keep as much power as she possibly could. But she realised because she wasn't popular in Egypt at the time and she didn't have the backing of the court because they supported her brother um, and royal advisors that she needed to get it from someone else. So she looked towards Caesar. She was kind of following in her father's footsteps because he'd already had the backing and support of Pompey the Great who is someone who had had a relationship with Caesar, they were both members of the Senate, they were related through marriage as well. So she kind of probably looked at that and thought that was a good way to go and that she needed a strong Roman person to have her back in. And there were two other kind of main things as well. Egypt provided most of Rome's grain, so she knew that she needed to keep control of the grain supply or at least have some kind of say or power over that so she couldn't do that without having a good relationship with Rome because if she didn't have a good relationship with Rome then they would just take it forcefully so it was in her interest to try and manage that the best that she could and the best way for her to do that was to kind of have that kind of relationship with a key Roman power player and that was Julius Caesar at the time. Caesar also had gone to Egypt because he wanted to claim back some of the money which he had loaned to Egypt to pay off its debts and she also realised that obviously to try and stop this turning again into quite a hostile situation it would be more beneficial for her to try and manage that the best way that she could so if she could get into some kind of relationship with Caesar whatever kind that could be we don't know at this point whether she thought that she was going to do it romantically yeah we do was, <laughs> well or we were going to do it kind of in other ways but it made more sense for her to be able to have him on her side because by doing that she might be able to get the debt scrapped she might be able to get it reduced she might be able to kind of pay it back over a longer period or she might be able to basically use herself take from this what you will to actually act as some kind of the debt repayment scheme whoa, 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 whoa. are you suggesting cleopatra is some kind of gold digger there taylor I'm suggesting that she was much more than a gold digger, but that was just one of the strings to her bow, Mr. Midgley. James, sounds like a gold digger to you? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty I mean, the other thing we should look at is this relationship with her brother and why she desperately wants to get out of this. The Ptolemies... Go Sorry, I got very nervous when you said relationship with her brother, because yeah. I know how this goes. It sometimes. is that relationship <laughs> with her brother. The Ptolemies, as you may or may not know, had this bizarre habit of marrying siblings to each other to keep the bloodline pure. So there you are, nine-year-old Cleopatra, uh, co-ruler of Egypt, being a woman, obviously, she was second to the man she was married to, and has to marry a brother. Fun and game so far? James it, is playing a great face. I mean, to be fair, this is kind of what I expected. Yeah, it's probably what she expected but didn't want. I mean, the other string to that bow is as well, the Ptolemies don't get on really well with siblings, wives or husbands, so it's almost certain that yeah part of this move to caesar is she wants to get rid of her brother i mean you're married to him he's your brother it's a bit weird but if she can get rid of him with a powerful ally and let's face it at this time caesar's just about the most powerful man you can come across if she can get on caesar's good side or whichever side he wants her on she can get rid of her brother she can become sole queen of egypt um and take control from there so there's absolutely lots of reasons to meet Caesar and killing your brother husband as a phrase you'd never think you'd use killing your brother husband is obviously a benefit here but it's not just her husband and that particular brother that she wants to get rid of she systematically wipes out her entire kind of sibling um section of her family because she wants to kind of take control and she wants power for herself so she gets her sisters murdered she gets her other brother murdered as well possibly doesn't she lock one in a temple well yeah so that's the sister so both of her sisters are killed 
her other brother that she marries it she marries later on after this first one he's got <laughs> sorry james's face has just gone from well oh my god to, i was oh. i was waiting to chip in with a question like if one brother died are they that committed to this they just marry them to another sibling? they just marry the other brother oh my god. Uh, yeah. but he also dies in mysterious circumstances she's even in some sources it's suggested that she is responsible for the death of her own father and that she has also bumped her dad off because she wants to take power as well Happy families so in Egypt. She will get rid of anyone. <coughs> Moral of the story, never marry your sister, never marry your brother, and try not to kill all your siblings. The other thing as well, though, we've sort of alluded it to before, if she does make this good connection with Caesar, which she's going to do absolutely everything she can to get it, and we'll find out more in a bit later, she's not just getting an ally within Egypt. Like I've said, Caesar is just about the most powerful man in the known world and if you're to believe what people say about Cleopatra once you waft away all the accusations of sleeping with things that move um, she's, she comes across as quite an ambitious woman so the easiest way to get power not just in Egypt but the entire Roman world is to back a horse that you think is going to win and at that, this time that is Caesar if she can secure herself as Caesar's confidant or consort or unlikely wife um she technically will have the ear of the most powerful man in the known world and that can only work well for her or so she thinks she hasn't got a lot to lose either no she's, she's not got a lot to lose i mean a marriage to one brother or another brother james so why was she so unpopular why didn't they like her <sighs> for me because she was egyptian the in, Romans, in Egypt. Yeah, uh, in Egypt, well, in Egypt they didn't like her because she was Greek. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's it's complicated. Also, the Ptolemies were really not very popular. They'd done a lot of bit shady things. They'd kept power within a Greek elite. Yeah. They'd moved the capital to the north so the people in the south of Egypt felt kind of a bit like the north south divide in Britain mm. but flipped. So they weren't really popular. They'd had about 300 years of gradually declining rule and she was seen as the latest of a bad batch mm -hmm. and her own personal actions equally did not go down too well certainly the more conservative Egyptians they didn't like her kind of brash openness and the fact that she's a woman wanting soul control will not have sat well with a lot of people <laughs> so on to the big event then so this is particularly in Plutarch life of Julius Caesar 49 um, and if you're using the OCR guide notes, uh, it's page 7 in the source booklet. So, this meeting, straight from the go out, I mean, see, uh, see where you think this is going, James. Okay, I, mean, I got see. Limited knowledge. So, it's not a state meeting, this is a meeting of two world leaders. And it's not done in some big summit or grand meeting at the palace. We're told that the meeting starts, well, she's smuggled in to Caesar's palace at night. And she so, only takes with her one person guy called Apollodorus who's a Sicilian what relevance that has to do they don't go through the front door that's ob too obvious they go by boat because um, you know, obviously if you're sneaking around go by boat yeah I guess yeah I, either way so they go in so they're not noticed and just to add to this even more she's smuggled into Caesar's palace in either a rolled up carpet or a sleeping bag or a bed sack I mean, I assume this is still how statecraft is conducted today. Absolutely. I mean, I'm pretty sure this is how Donald Trump meets all world leaders and Boris Johnson. Just how he'd like to meet them all. <laughs> you well, need a really big carpet. Yeah, but be careful because she's not just snuck into Caesar's palace, she's snuck into his chambers uh -huh. at night. Well, it's her palace, isn't it? It's her and her brother's palace. Caesar is just kind of taken up residence there. Yeah, I mean, he, so like I say, he's the most powerful man in the world. He's turned up to Egypt with an army. I'm pretty sure he's. She's been smuggled into her own house in a carpet. That, that is sounds... what he's saying. Yeah, ultimately smuggled into Caesar's bedchamber in a carpet, and then you get this really lovely description of how the sleeping bag she's revealed to Caesar from the sleeping bag. Um, take from that what you will about revealing herself to Caesar but ultimately this is this is pretty straightforward for a first date if you're looking at it like that it's clear what her motives are I mean she said it's all that but is is that how things were done back then is that normal well is it normal we don't know so yeah she's revealed to Caesar in his chambers and then we're told he at first takes a shine to her and he's 
warmed by her charming company and wit and pleasant conversation. Um, and clearly it works because no one sees hiding a hair of them for at, until at least the next morning. So there's been, shall we say, some long discussions about yeah. statecraft. In depth and, discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then they proceed to spend the next couple of days just hanging out together and going for nice dinners and sailing up and down the Nile. I mean, that's what I don't know what else you do in Egypt. Sailing up go, and down go look the at Nile. The pyramids. Yeah, maybe it does mention that. But yeah, so they sail up and down the Nile. Um, and this meeting, clearly, from her point of view, is terribly successful. Probably from Caesar's point of view as well. I mean, he's not had a bad meeting out of this, shall we say? He was 52 and she was 21. So, there you go. There you go. He's happy with how things have. And he's also, he's, he's married. He's well known for having lots of different affairs. He's got more than a uh, roving eye, shall we say. <laughs> it's not so, just his eye that's roving. No, <laughs> no, everything is. Um, so, yeah, it's she's definitely she's using her feminine wiles. But when uh, our tool boy was asking, kind of, is this norm? Is this the norm? Is this a normal thing to happen? For a woman, no. But for a man, yes but obviously not with the same kind of political implications because they wouldn't be just kind of having sexual relationships with women because that would kind of affect their power status because women didn't have any power but that is what she is doing so they might want to have like get married to other wealthy kind of senators part of the like the upper sections of roman society but women didn't have the same kind of role as men so they didn't have the same kind of impact or input so a bit on the side is quite normal a bit on the side is very normal and uh, men were allowed to do that without getting into trouble whereas for women if they were married and they were having an affair then they would get into a whole heap of trouble so it's a very kind of one-sided thing so i think personally i don't know maybe this is just because i'm a woman I think um, <laughs> we're still but, awaiting confirmation <laughs> but um, she just gets a bad rep because she's she is a woman she's not doing anything very different to what men were doing the only thing that makes her different is her gender but she knows what she's doing she's using her feminine wiles to get what she wants but it's kind of like well can you blame her? I'm assuming Caesar isn't naive to what she's doing. Probably not, but you've got that juxtaposition, haven't you? Who is manipulating who mm. and who's getting more out of it? Is, is it, it her or is, is it, it him? Is it mutually beneficial? I mean, I'm sure at various points they yeah. both found this equally, shall we say, beneficial. Um, but yeah, she, she is also using the one thing that she can use that is unique to her, the fact that she is a woman and she can use these powers to get what she wants. Had she gone for a proper state visit, as a co-ruler of Egypt, she would probably have had to go with her brother, yeah. who she's trying to kill, and who she's trying to get Caesar's support against, and that leads to some burning of libraries, and we won't mention that because it's such a sad event. Um, but yeah, so she's ma arranging this secret meeting away from her brother. If it had been a formal state meeting, absolutely, she'd have had to bring the yeah. brother husband um <laughs> we'll make it normal before you say it the brother husband <laughs> um how about if i sing it so she'd have to bring the brother husband and given the stately the courtly manners of the time she'd probably have to sit outside room while they those two went and talked business where she knows if she goes it this way in secret she can determine what business is done yeah literally and figuratively and she can get her foot in the door early and leave a brother out in the cold. But ultimately, she's got to have something to back that up with. So she's not, she's not just a bit of skirt. And we know from looking at quite a few of the sources, she's not necessarily what they would possibly class as someone who is beautiful. If we look at sources that show what she was more likely to look like, like coinage from the period, she's got very kind of pronounced features which Big are not nose. yeah which are not necessarily <laughs> something that the romans would necessarily probably have found that attractive because it was so opposite to them and kind of their version of what they see as beautiful because ultimately that would have been their women 
their culture. Was that an Egyptian beautiful though? Or? Well, we don't we don't know because she's not Egyptian. She so she's got a Greek she's got Greek heritage. Her descendants are related to Alexander the Great. They're not Egyptian. We know that she just looks she will have looked different. Um she probably would have been like quite dark skinned. She's got these different kind of features. I think that yes, it's probably her suggestive nature, but again we don't know this. She I mean the fact have... that she comes as queen of a very wealthy country yeah. also sweetens the deal. Yeah. You know, there's there's benefits on both sides. But she's also kind of described as being very intelligent. She could speak multiple languages. She's supposed to have a really good sense of humour, have a very quick wit, have a good intellect. So, All of which were key to this first meeting in the middle of the night in Caesar's bedroom, obviously. But she's got to have, something, she's got to have something to back it up, hasn't she? It's fine, that initial kind of, woohoo! But then after that, there's got to be something she there. She needs something to secure to, the longevity. To, to keep that going, otherwise yeah. he's just going to lose interest and move on to the next, you know, yeah, I mean, if, bit on the side. If nothing else from this and later when she meets Mark Antony, if nothing else we can definitely say, Cleopatra is a woman who knows how to make an entrance. She knows how to make people pay attention to her, and she knows how to get all eyes, or in this case, one set of eyes, on her. But then playing devil's advocate, do the Romans just see her as someone that's weak and they can just basically underestimate her at the beginning? Does Caesar think, oh, I'll sleep with her and then she'll be under my spell and I can do what I want with her? But it doesn't work like that. So again, it's they think they're being better, but are they really? They're not. That's a weakness that she's exploiting, even though they don't see it as them being weak. It's a hell of a lot from one quick meeting. <laughs> so obviously, now that we know what happened, we've got to address some of these issues with around reliability. And not uniquely, it's not uncommon for people in ancient history classes who've just read it know a little bit about Cleopatra to suggest she's a scat. Yeah, we've all heard it. But she's <laughs> from Caesar. There's problems with the account, but there's good things with the account as well. So we'll start with like one good thing. The source we use particularly is from Plutarch. Plutarch of all the ancient historians and all the ancient writers, he's usually regarded as one of the most reliable. He's a trained philosopher, he's a man philosopher, he's a man who's independently wealthy and spends a huge amount of time writing his comparative lives and he does this throughout the entirety of his life. And they are regarded as good, significant and reliable. They've lasted these 2,000 years. He's particularly known as well for being quite critical of the, quite critical of the sources he reads. So when he researches these, he doesn't just toddle along and write down the first thing that he comes across. He's not a Livy who will just write down what he finds and then write another version. It'll be critical. So if, James, you would say, you know, Cleopatra is a sket, a <laughs> um, you know, a bit, but then try and find other sources and see if it's... So if back that, up yeah, see if it backs up. Unfortunately with Plutarch, um, because of all the primary sources around Cleopatra, they all suggest the same thing about Cleopatra, that she is a sket. Um, but as a writer, he is reliable and he tries to reliable and he tries to be as balanced as possible. The other things he mentions are little things like his detail is quite particular. So he mentions, he doesn't just say she went to the palace with some random Sicilian. He names individuals like Apollodorus. His level of precision is very, very specific. But that's not to say Plutarch is an entirely reliable source. There are issues with Plutarch generally, and then there are issues with this particular passage that we're looking at, which is 48, 49 um, in Julius Caesar, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So the main things are that he was writing a hundred things are that he was writing a hundred years after the events happened. So obviously that's going to massively affect the quality of the information that he can get hold of. There are issues as well with the sources that he was actually using. So it's got loads of details on this in your textbook on page 172. But some of the key things that he said, um, his sources for Cleopatra um, aren't that clear. He claims his grandfather had a friend who knew Cleopatra's cook. That old one. Yeah, My granddad that, knew a guy, he was there, he was... My uncle's brother's best mate's postman. Yeah. 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 
um, and he had access to a memoir of Cleopatra's doctor Pis. but again even if he does have those things that he can use they're not going to be that detailed about what she's thinking what she's feeling kind of why she's acting the way that she's acting those are people that are playing a very minuscule part in her life so that is something that we need to think about. We also need to think about the fact that he was also need to think about the fact that he was very much more concerned, although we just write chronologically, they were, he was more concerned with kind of the character of the person and what they were like more than setting out what we would class as a modern kind of historical account. But we can say that about most ancient authors. But again, when we study Cleopatra, none of the authors write about Cleopatra. She's not important enough to be the main event. She's the side character. So Plutarch's not writing Life of Cleopatra. No. He's like writing Life of Julius Caesar and Life of Mark Antony. She's just a, a returning cameo role. Sup yeah, supporting guest star. Yeah, she's the... Sub um, and again, with her character, she her character will be recorded in a way to put forward what Plutarch wants you to know about Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. And like all of Plutarch's biographies, he likes this idea of an arc, this, these great men who achieve great things, but ultimately come across some, come across some fundamental human weakness. Um, and in terms of Julius Caesar, one of the fundamental human weaknesses is Cleopatra. So she's never really going to get a perfectly balanced a good rail. No, yeah. no, there's always going to be someone going, I hate her. <laughs> but that is an issue in itself that a lot of that he's that a lot of that he's obviously writing from a Roman point of view. She's very much a sideline in what he's writing about. And most of the sources that if he's looking at other sources that are more kind of probably more available and more detailed, if they're from a Roman point of view, like you were saying before they're always going to be quite negative about, about what a normal Roman woman or the antithesis of what a good Roman woman should be like. Comple Cleopatra is the complete opposite, so she's always going to get a bad deal, generally. And then there's other things to do with that particular source, so 49, which just don't add up. So you need to think about, there's apparently a plot against Caesar, um, and I can't think where it is, but this plot is supposed to be happening and someone lets Caesar know. But the person that lets Caesar know about this supposed plot, how would they know about this plot in the first place? How would they find out about that? Do we really believe do we really believe that she was smuggled in in a carpet? How did no one see someone <laughs> hiking a massive carpet hey, 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 over is someone their trying to get in now with a, is that someone else Was it not commonplace in ancient Egypt for giant Sicilian men to haul carpets about in the middle of the night. Not like the ancient equivalent of a DFS delivery where someone just <laughs> got and decides DFS to... DFS Ikea, can you imagine having to put it together yourself? <laughs> so there are, there are obviously issues with this particular source that we're looking at. It's, it's... The, the other thing to mention as well is if you go into this extent to arrange a secret meeting, the last thing you want to do is take along someone to write everything down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're sneaking off somewhere, you don't normally go, oh, tell you what, I'll bring, bring my a, chronicle. Bring the chronicle with me in case <laughs> this is important later on. Um, again, with all the sources that Plutarch would look at, and this will be a recurring theme, and we'll probably do another session particularly on these, a lot of the sources are written by others of Octavian, who becomes the person she is ultimately pitted against. She becomes the enemy of Octavian. Without spoiling the end, Octavian triumphs throughout all of this. Everyone else dies. So how do you secure your triumph even more? You get all of your mates to write about how evil and rub rubbish and sketty so basic, basically, basically, like the ancient slag them off on Facebook or something. Absolutely. Like that. Oh God, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. How how do you really you go to work on someone, you defeat them, and then you start slagging them off after their death? And Plutarch, even though he's trying to be balanced, will be victim to this. If you've got twenty, if you've got twenty sources saying Cleopatra's a hoe, mm. then you you're going to write. You <laughs> can't write anything other than Cleopatra is a hoe. The other thing, particularly if this ever comes up in an exam extract, look for little things that Plutarch keeps dropping in. So about four or five lines down, he uses a little phrase like, it is... T so straight away, usually the exam board likes to stick these little, these little hooks for you to find something. Straight away you can say, it's probably not that reliable, because even Plutarch's saying, oh, it is said that. He doesn't know for sure, he's basically saying, 
Karen down the street told us <laughs> this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's not Karen. It's um, I can't think of his stupid name. Horace. It's Horace or Virgil. Virgil said this and that she'd done this and she did what behind the bike shed. With Caesar. <laughs> it's that kind of he said, she said. And Plutarch is recording this. The other thing to really obvious point to make is this is a bit dramatic. It's ve it's all it's ve it's all it's bit too scripted, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I I never go around someone's house in a sleeping bag and reveal myself to them. What do you, what do you yeah. spend your weekends well, doing, literally? Oh, you get arrested. Well, I'm not allowed to anymore after the last <laughs> time. But yeah, it's all very dramatic. How do we know this? Plutarch seems to have this complete inside, inside line. Who's recording this? And yeah, do you really want... Surely it give the game away. If you see, so you're sat in bed, someone brings a sleeping bag in <laughs> and a scribe. Um, not sure I'm quite into why this is she, yeah, Why is she not stopped? Why is she not stopped before she gets in there? Even if it's not by anyone from the palace, if not, he would have had other people with him. Yeah, most powerful man in the world. You'd expect some kind of Praetorian guard. Or... And I've just had a look now and I've found where it is, but apparently the person that tells Caesar about this supposed plot to get rid of him, it was his barber. Now, most, <laughs> most pictures of Caesar that we see, he does not Sorry, have, that we see, he does not Sorry, have uh, a lot of hair. So why does he need a mobile hairdresser right, to go and be stood there taking it so all in? I'm just thinking of Cedric the Entertainer in Barbershop the movie now. If you've not seen Barbershop the movie, watch it, it's brilliant. Um, yeah, he's barber. Wow. So, yeah, Secret Service, Intelligence Agent, no, Barbers. Barbers, barbers, barbers. are where it's at. Also, I mean, you've got to remember, it's really lucky for Cleopatra that she got smuggled in on laundry day. Yeah? Yeah. What's yeah. the way you do that? Oh, laundry. Coincidence. Yeah. Where are you off to? Oh, just carpet delivery. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> middle of the night, that's when I have my carpet oh. delivered. It's cheaper, it's like Tesco's order. <laughs> peak. Off peak hours. So, obviously, it's a great story. It's a wonderfully silly story. It's a dramatic story. Um, it's a key part in what happens next but really like anything else we've got to decide is it 100 percent accurate is it reliable james that's our non-expert no no ish <laughs> no ish there you have it the official words from james the science tool point how reliable is this no, no ish, ish. <laughs> so there you have it the meeting of julius caesar and cleopatra reliable ish um, we hope this has been useful. If you want, leave us a nice comment in at the bottom, but bear in mind this is our first time. Please be nice. And until next time, see you later. Bye. 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 And we actually did all wave to the laptop then. Don't ask why. Same reason why we're all wearing togas. You can't see the benefit. It's for us. Bye. <laughs>